Once the door had been opened for you, once Larry Haynes was known by the producers of radio shows, did they call you or did you call them? In other no. words, did you have to do a lot of auditioning no. for work? No, no. Once, uh, once you were established, as most of the names who are familiar to you, you were called. The producer or director would read a script and say vocally, Larry Haynes is right or Dick is right or so-and-so is right, and that's the way they would cast it once in a while. They would hold auditions, but very rarely would a show like Gangbusters or Inner Sanctum or, or any of those audition people for parts. No, there, it was very tough, unfortunately, for people to break into radio who were not known. And their entree pretty much were the sustaining shows, which are the shows that the networks produced that were non-commercial. And that was their entree to radio. The National Broadcasting Company brings you now an address by Adlai Stevenson from the International Amphitheater in Chicago. Direct from the International Amphitheater in Chicago, we are brought to bring you an address by former Governor Adlai E. Stevenson, 1952 candidate for president on the Democratic ticket. Mr. Stevenson is speaking before a dinner of the Democratic National Committee. Now, to introduce Mr. Stevenson... Here is Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago. Fellow Democrats, welcome to Chicago. In every critical period of American history, there has appeared a man whose words carried the full meaning of American democracy. After September 22, 1955, X minus one was once again pulled from the air. He returned two weeks later on October 6th. The show moved to Wednesdays on November 16th. It would remain there for the next 20 episodes, finally establishing some continuity. He was appointed chief of the United States delegation to the preparatory commission. 1956 would be a presidential election year in the United States. On November 19th, Democratic hopeful Adlai Stevenson was on the campaign trail in Chicago. The atomic age was fully underway. Three days later, a Soviet jet dropped the first Soviet thermonuclear bomb in Siberia. That same day, Colonel Tom Parker signed Elvis Presley to RCA Records. America celebrated Thanksgiving on November 24th at the height of Cold War fear. The following week, on November 30th, the first Soviet Antarctic expedition, led by Mikhail Somov, would begin. The times were definitely changing. Our own Adelaide E. Stevenson. Mayor Daly, Mr. President Truman, my fellow Democrats who I am honored to welcome to Illinois, to Chicago, and to the International Amphitheater once again. I thought I had a good speech for you here tonight, but I've discovered that it has a serious defect. Among the nine preceding speakers, you have already heard it. That week at 8 p.m. from Hollywood, CBS broadcast two 15-minute serials. The first was My Son Jeep, and the second was yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tim Connors, John Boy. Congratulate me. Congratulations, Tim. What for? I just had another boy. Seven pounds, 12 ounces. Hey, you like cigars? Sure. Well, come on down and pick one up. Oh, maybe you better pack a suitcase, too. I got one for you out in Culver, Montana. Where is that? I just told you. Out in Montana somewhere. We have a debt policy holder there named Henderson. Henderson, huh? Yeah. Now, we don't know if he was murdered, committed suicide, or had an accident. Well, what does it look like? All three. Okay, Tim. Be there in an hour. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter, whatever it's going to be. Expense account item one, dollar and a quarter for a detailed map. I had an idea that Culver, Montana was a place that only Rand McNally might know about. They did. I found it tucked up in the high northern corner of the state near Great Falls. Hey, where's your bag? Home. I told you to pack it. Now look, Give John. Give me a cigar, Tim. Tell me about the new boy in the new case. Okay, have a chair. There you are. I wouldn't smoke it if I were you. Terrible. Cost me two bucks a box. Hey, you know something? I'm thinking of naming the new boy Johnny. Oh, tough case, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Look, look. We're in the same sweet old spot, Johnny. Same old problem. One of our policyholders is dead, and for looking into the circumstances of his death... The insurance company is no longer a friend of the widow and orphan, but a big, bad monster trying to weasel out of a just claim. All claims are just claims, or are they? Well, of course they are. No one ever tried to pull a fast one on an insurance company. Well, the world's full of nice, honest, straight-playing people. Uh Uh-huh. Now tell me about getting sandbagged in a poker game. Look, I want to get this out of the way and get back over to the hospital and see my wife. Now, John, this claim came into the insurance office yesterday afternoon, airmail special. The insurance company turned it over to me today. What company? Western. The policy's worth $25,000 face value, double indemnity if death was by accident. No payment for suicide. Uh Uh-huh. You say the man's name was Henderson? Yeah, it says here, George Walter Henderson, Montana rancher. Last Thursday, he fell four stories out of a hotel window in Culver and died instantly. At least that's what we have in this report here. Somebody could have shoved him, or he could have taken the leap. Now, we have to know for certain. Oh, what's on the claim report? Accidental. There was no inquest, no police investigation, and that's not good enough for us. Ah, uh-huh. This Henderson prominent? Well, he was big enough, Johnny. Cattleman, rancher. He was also a major stockholder and the only newspaper in cover, so I doubt if his paper suggests suicide or anything else. Do you? I don't know, Tim. I never met the editor. Well, meet him if you like. Talk to him. Talk to anybody in cover. Find out what was what. <laughs> this is a lousy cigar. Johnny... You know how to handle these things. We have to have more information than this. Have you tried to do anything on it at all? Yeah, I phoned the sheriff's office long distance to talk to a man named Holton, Eve Holton. He said he'd be happy to cooperate. Uh, what else? I phoned the beneficiary to get some information. Name's Pauline Henderson, his widow. Is she going to cooperate too? I don't think so, pal. Huh? She hung up on me. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. By Wednesday the 30th, it was known that George Henderson's death was no accident. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Eve Holden, son. Hi, Sheriff. You put in a call for me, did you? Yes, I'm ready to go to work. Now that the inquest's been held and George Henderson's death is officially an accident, I might be able to move around your little town a little easier. What can I do for you? Help me to move around. Uh, The case is closed, as far as I'm concerned. Eve, what's the matter with you? That inquest was a farce. For all I know, Henderson could have been pushed out of that hotel window. The attitude of different people in this town makes that whole thing... Hold on now, son. Hold on. I meant to say it's closed as far as my office is concerned. Personally, I think it needs investigating. We can help each other, maybe, you and me. Can I come over? Oh, I better come there. You know how folks are around here. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Culver, Montana, to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The question, accident, suicide, or murder? Expense account item four, $3.48. One day later to Tim Connors' office in Hartford explaining the situation in Culver. I'll, uh, I'll read it back to you, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Tim Connors, Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. Coroner's inquest into death of George Henderson, policy number EMP-196667, found death to be accidental. In my opinion, the inquest was not thorough. 
have decided to stay on in Culver and conduct my own investigation. If any change, please advise via Western Union, Butte Hotel, Culver. Am forwarding copy of coroner's verdict this date. Best regards, Dollar. Correct? Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, sure. Expense account item five, 68 cents, postage. I mailed a copy of the coroner's verdict to Hartford Airmail Special. After that, I went back to my hotel to wait for the sheriff, Eve Holton. Come on in, Eve. I... Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar, my name's Porter. I'm the manager of this hotel. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Porter. I, I can't right now. I've got some other things to attend to. Well... Anything I can do for you, Mr. Porter? I, I'm going to have to ask you for your room, Mr. Dollar. Oh, when? Uh, t today. Any particular reason? We're all filled up. Uh, the, the room's been reserved for six weeks. By whom? What? Who reserved it? Why, uh, a man from Bozeman. It, it's a sort of convention. Sort of convention. What kind of convention is that, Mr. Porter? Look, Mr. Dollar, you'll have to leave this room today. The man's coming in tonight. Uh huh. And there's no other hotel in town. That's the way it is, Mr. Dollar. No other place to stay? No. So I have to pack my bags and get out of town, is that it? I must have the room, Mr. Dollar. Who asked you to say you wanted the room, Mr. Porter? Who asked you to come here and kick me out? Why, no one, I... Well, I, you I... go back to no one, Mr. Porter, and you tell no one that I'm staying right here in this room here in Culver until I finish what I have to do here. You tell that to no one, will you? Mr. Dollar, I'd, I'd hate to call the police. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Be sure and tell them about the sort of convention you're having and how all the rooms are sold out. Tell them about Mr. No One and tell them I called your bluff. Anything else, Mr. Porter? I was at the stage where I was beginning to take notes for myself. Note one. The mayor didn't want to have an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Note two. When they did have an inquest, they didn't want to really find out anything. Note three. Mr. Hotel Manager wanted me to keep on not finding out anything by getting me out of town. I explained all of this to Eve Holton when he showed up a half an hour later. Well, kind of, kind of tight, isn't it? I don't know what that means, Sheriff, but it's pretty stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's stupid, son, but it could be effective. Now, I'll tell you what. If Porter calls the police, I'm the police. So don't worry about that. I'll hem him and haw him. All right, thanks. Now then, uh, tell me how much your insurance company stuck for. $50,000 if Henderson's death goes by as an accident. The good book says that's what it was. I know, I know. There's a chance, too, we had a heart failure and fell out of that window. No, oh, sure. Always a chance. We might have to dig him up and find out, Sheriff. Oop, uh, hold on. Autopsies and digging people up is one thing you'd have a hard time doing around here. I might insist on it, I don't know. Well, let that go for now. Say, tell me about Mrs. Henderson. Where's she from? Here. Right here in Culver. Now, she didn't get that mink coat and those diamonds she was wearing at the inquest in Culver. More important, she didn't get that continental look here either. So what's the story? Well, her name was Pauline Underwood before she married George. Born and raised right here in Culver. Of course, she went to school in the East, and she's been in Europe a couple of times, but most of her life's been right here. She is a mighty pretty widow. And a mighty rich one, too. Henderson had it. I know. This divorce she talked about at the inquest yesterday. Well, everybody in town knew they weren't getting along, never did get along. How could they? Pauline's 26 and George is 59. He could have been her father. As a matter of fact, he almost was. Well, tell me about that. You got a drink? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, George raised Pauline from the time she was 14. He paid for all her schooling and growing up. She didn't have any folks after her old man died. George was pretty good to her. He sure was. <laughs> was he a friend of her parents? Well, Tom Underwood worked out at the ranch for George. When he died, there was Pauline standing there. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. And she eventually married him and his money, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way exactly. I, I think she liked him. Now, I, I've gone over what you're thinking, son. Those two were talking about divorce for some time. The papers had been drawn up for a settlement. She'd have got a lot of alimony and so on. Oh, Pauline had no call to push him out that window or have him pushed out. At least not for money. All right. 
Suppose he didn't want a divorce. Suppose he loved her and she came to the hotel room that morning and he pleaded with her to try all over again. Suppose she said no. Suppose she said no in a great big cold way. And George Henderson sat there and thought about it after she left. And he got sick all over and he walked over to that window and... Suicide? What do you think? You know him. Uh, he wasn't a suicide type. So. Oh, nobody's the suicide type until they come to the end of the line, Eve. Then it's too late to interview them and ask them how they got there. Everybody seems to think it was an accident, so I'm just throwing words around. Mm, you have a right to do that if you aren't satisfied, son. Hey, getting back to this hotel again. Who might want me to get out of town and not ask any questions? Anybody. Well, who? No idea. But it's somebody who has some feelings in this. Hey, who owns this hotel, Eve? Noah Baxter. Who's Noah Baxter? Rancher. Got a place about 15 miles from here. Pretty big man. Uh huh. Friend of Henderson's? Yeah. Hmm. And let me put that question a little different. Baxter, a friend of Mrs. Henderson's? I don't know. Can you find out? I can try. Well, find out about him and any other friends, Eve. Friends that might be younger, that might have gone to Europe or school in the East. Yeah. <sighs> sure. What are you thinking now, son? Well, now, if I were Mrs. Henderson and my husband fell out of a window in this hotel and killed himself, I'd hire a lawyer and I'd sue the hotel for damages. If the insurance company didn't pay off my claim, I'd hire a lawyer and insist that they pay that claim. I'd do those things right away, Sheriff, especially if I thought it was all legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours later, I received a wire from Tim Connors. He requested me to look up a man named Thurber, an insurance broker living in Great Falls. For more information on yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Spencer tune into Breaking Walls, episode 102. You were talking about things that went wrong on shows, and this was a show that uh, he was writing called Now It Can Be Told. It started just after the war. I was on that one day, and usually, you know, when the actors came in, they sort of turned, where's my part? I'm on page 16. They made a mental note of it, and kept the script open to that page, but that day, for some strange reason, I followed the script. I don't know what led me to do that. And there was an elderly actor on that show, Martin Gable was the narrator, who suddenly got to a word, a name, that he fluffed. And he tried it again and couldn't get it. He tried it a third time and then said, oh, the hell with it. <laughs> and walked away from the mic. <laughs> well, Martin's narration was coming in. And Martin took a deep breath, and I was looking at the script, and he said, the freighter Marianne was on a northwest... <laughs> <laughs> and I came in, I said, heading, and continued on her course. <laughs> oh, really? Did Martin regain By that time, Martin, Martin came back in again after he'd... I think that would tend to sober you up, too, if uh, the actor playing opposite you managed to retain his composure. I, I've had that experience where uh, mm -hmm. you suddenly become embarrassed within yourself because you realize what you have done or almost caused to occur, and the other actor has been perhaps at that moment a little yeah. more professional than you. And, well, you, uh, I don't think it was being more professional. I think you caught a look of the director, oh. whose name was Tony Leader, sure. and he was right. dead white. Yeah, was Tony, dead white. And Tony Leader was a very dark-skinned chap. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen him that. <laughs> That pale in my life. <laughs> Opposite on NBC, X-1 took to the air with Vital Factor. It's the story of a ruthless tycoon who desires space travel at all costs. X-1, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X, 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 X minus, 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 minus one... one, one, one. Tonight's story, The Vital Factor by Nelson Bond.
I doubt that anywhere on earth there's a man or woman or a child who doesn't know the name Wayne Crowder. I doubt whether there's a human being who hasn't at one time or another used one of the Crowder products. The can opener or the razor blade or the patented tooth powder dispenser or the Crowder improved slideless fastener. In the magazines which write about men of business, Crowder was described as a man of ice and stone and ink and steel. No warmth to his blood. And a heart to pump, not feel human emotion. And he built a battery of buttons into his desk so that when he wanted something, all he ever had to do was press a button. And like genies springing out of the bottle, the proper personnel would come running. Yes, Mr. Crowder? Get me my engineers. Yes, sir, right away, Mr. Crowder. Here are your engineers, sir. All right, close the door and get out. Now, gentlemen, sit down. Gentlemen, I want you to build me a spaceship. A spaceship, sir? That's right. I've decided that I'm going to be the man who gives space flight to mankind. Any questions? Um, sir, we can design such a ship. That part isn't too hard. Yes, but... But we've no way of providing the motor to power such a ship. When the ship's ready to fly, there'll be a motor. Sir, I... I don't like to contradict you, but you can't go ahead of the total technology of a historical period. It's like asking somebody in 1600 to build the internal combustion engine. You see, scientists have been searching for a motive power for spaceships for decades now without success. You'll have a ship, but we can't lift that ship from the Earth's surface. That is... Not to the point of free flight, at any rate. Mr. Crowder, <clears throat> uh, you see you'll be spending millions of dollars, hundreds of millions, perhaps, for nothing. What's your name? Phillips, sir. You're fired. Go down to the cashier and draw your pay and get out. What, sir? Get out. Nobody who works for me thinks of how much something costs. What? We use money. We don't let expense provide a rationalization for not beginning a project. All right, Phillips. I give you permission to leave. Right now. Any other comments? The ship will be built, of course, Mr. Crowder. The fact still remains, we can't power it. You design the ship, I'll find the motor for you. Where, sir? I don't know. But somewhere in the world, there's a man who does know the secret. I want that motor, and I'll root out the man who has the theory which will let us build it. How quickly do you want this done, sir? Yesterday. Yes, sir. Is there anything you need? We'll need a construction yard, sir, and certain machinery and a great many materials, of course. Uh, labor force. Get them. Send me the bills. I don't want to be bothered with minor details. Yes, sir. And uh, one more thing, sir. Uh, Phillips. Yes? We need him, sir. He's a top man on electronics. He's a vital cog in our team. I don't want Phillips working for me. That's clear, I hope. Who else in the country knows what he does? No one in this country, sir. There's a man in India, though. Get him. We've tried before, Mr. Crowder. He's working on an important project in his country. I'm not he... concerned with details. Get that man, pay him what he wants, but get him. Sir, you don't understand. If this man quits his job, that whole project will collapse. It means the welfare of many people, millions of people in his country. He has a high sense of patriotism. Buy that sense of patriotism. That's all. I don't want to see any of you again until you have a report of work in progress. Yes, sir. Miss Holmes, there's a man named Phillips going to draw his pay. I want two company policemen to meet him at the cashier's office and escort him from there directly off the premises, and I want them to be emphatic about it. Yes, Mr. Crowder. And notify the newspapers, the television, and the radio networks, the periodicals, and the scientific journals that I'll receive the press in my office this afternoon at 3.30. I have an important announcement to make. Anyone not here at 3.30 will be barred. And the publication or company he represents will not be given any further information. <laughs> Gentlemen, you can finish your drinks later. Gentlemen of the press and ladies, it's my pleasure to be able to tell you but I'm in the process of constructing a spaceship. Any questions? Did you say spaceship? That's right. That's what I thought you said. 
I knew the drinks weren't that strong. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Crowder, is this spaceship under construction now? It is. You've solved the problem of motive force then? No, sir. Well, what sort of... You mean you have no means of propulsion for this spaceship? That problem is not solved as yet. <laughs> oh, it will be! That's why I called you in this afternoon. I want you to announce that I have $100,000 in cash, waiting for the man or woman who first brings me the basic idea for such a motor. I'll supply all equipment for research and construction, and I'll see that the rights of the inventor are protected and more than adequate royalties will be paid him or her. That's all I have to say now. Mr. Crowder, one more question, please. Yes? Do you have a name for this spaceship yet? No, not yet. Well, then let me suggest one. Yes? Crowder's Folly. <laughs> quiet. All of you, quiet. <laughs> what is your paper? The Daily Times, sir. Miss Holmes, inform the company police that under no circumstances is any representative of the Daily Times ever to be allowed on company property again. Strike that paper from the list of those to be invited to future conferences. This episode, announced by Fred Collins, was written by Nelson Bond, starred Joe DeSantis, Brad Richards, Louis Van Ruten, John McGovern, and Guy Sorrell. I remember when I was starting, you see, I started the American Academy at a relatively late age. I remember being given tickets to a broadcast at NBC. They had audiences then on live broadcasts. And I remember sitting there and looking at all these actors who were in this show and thinking... Isn't it terrible, all these poor actors picking up maybe ten, fifteen dollars between plays? I didn't realize <laughs> <laughs> the financial advantages of radio. So I went into the theater, and I stayed in the theater for about three, four years. I, I played, uh, as a matter of fact, I played in Hartford in The Patriots mm -hmm. the, uh, by Sidney Kingsley. It's in the Bushnell Memorial Auditorium, which was a pretty large house. Yeah, and still, still is. is. <laughs> And uh, then when I came back from that, I went into radio, and I stayed in radio pretty much for about 12 years, uh, and I didn't do any theater, and then I went back into the theater and out of it and back in, and I'm going in again now. It was Crowder's folly, but the word of what he wanted circulated to the far corners of the globe. It was known in the white ice block huts of the Eskimos and in the grass-thatched villages of Central Africa, as well as places less remote. And the Crowder office became the mecca and the heaven for the lunatic fringe of humanity. Their blueprints and scale models clogged its corridors. I told you I don't want these people in my office till they're screened. Now get out, get out! Uh, every time I open that door, they surge in like a tidal wave. I have a progress report for you, sir. The ship is finished as far as we can go, Mr. Crowder. Certain additional construction can't be done now because it depends on the shape and mass of the engine, on the type of fuel, on the weight of that fuel. I see, all right. Lay off everybody we don't need. I've ordered that. Uh, Mr. Crowder, is it possible that no one will turn up with a motor? That's the one thing that's not possible. He will come. Money and determination will buy anything. Close the door on your way out. Yes, sir. Miss Holmes, order the proper department to put a name on the forward end of the ship. I want letters in pure gold one foot high. The name of the ship is Crowder's Folly. Get it done today. The sun came up in the morning, and the sun set at night, glinting rose on the silver sheen of the hollow ship's skin as it lay in the yard. The golden letters on the prow spelled out the fury of Crowder for the world to see. A staff of 50 were employed as time went on in taking rust preventative measures to ensure the ship's well-being. The staff of 50 worked in three shifts around the clock, armed with oil cans and grease cans and other containers and sprayers of preservatives. In a year... The first experiment seemed ready to bear fruit, and a test was held. The atomic fission motor. Oh. 
In exactly 45 seconds now, we'll hold the test, Mr. Crowder. The sound you hear is our generators here, building up power to supply the motor by remote control. If this needle goes round to the part of the dial marked in red, there'll be an explosion. Are there any questions, sir? Proceed with the tests. Watch the needle, sir. 8,000. 8,500. 9,000. 10. 11. 12. 15. That's an overload now, sir. 18. 20. I don't know how much more it can... What happened? His generator blew out. What kind of a I beg your pardon, sir. The motor blew up. What are you talking about? I would have heard. You see, sir, it takes a while for the vibrations of an explosion to travel three miles and then reach through 15 feet of concrete. I see. Well, there are other experiments in progress. Let me know when they're ready for testing. Yes, sir. Mr. Crowder, the inventor of that motor had to be right with it, of course, during the tests. He had a family. The fool knew what he was doing. He understood the danger. He was paid enough to be able to afford insurance. The cost of insurance on such a project was prohibitive, sir. Well, if his wife was thrifty, she saved out of what he earned this last year. His salary was relatively small, sir. Most of the money went for the research. He should have demanded an adequate salary. I haven't stated on money. The fool failed. I have no further responsibility. Yes, sir. You want us to continue screening applicants? Of course. All right. Make a settlement on the widow. And don't turn anyone away if he seems to have the remotest possibility of success. I'm telling you, my man will come. Money and determination will buy anything. And strangely enough, Crowder was right. Because one day there came to his office a stranger, a small man. He looked even smaller in that tremendous room. He was an unusual visitor in that he carried no briefcase fat with blueprints or formulae. He was unusual in that he neither blustered, cowered, nor deferred to his host. He was a pleasant little stranger, bird-like of eye and movement, bright and smiling. Mr. Crowder, my name is Wilkins. I can power that ship you want. So? Of course, what I have in mind won't be anything like that meaningless, huge bullet your engine is built for you. Rockets are a foolish waste of time, sir. My motor requires a different sort of vessel. Where are your plans? Right here, in my head. It so happens that I am presently supporting half a dozen people who make the same claims. None of them have been successful. What makes you think your idea will work? Simple enough, sir. The common magnet. Huh? Electromagnetism. Utilization of the force of gravity, or its opposite in this case, counter-gravity. Oh, no. Oh, thank you very much. Now, if you'll forgive me now... Uh, just one moment, Mr. Crowder... There's one thing more. This. Now, I've seen pieces of metal before. Thank you. How high from your desk would you say that I'm holding it? I'm very sorry, Mr. Wilkins. Now, do you want to leave or do you want to be escorted out? Now, this will only take a second, sir. How high from your desk would you say that I'm holding this piece of metal? A foot and a half, I'd say. And if I let go, then in less than a second, a fraction of a second, it should fall to your desk. Now, look, I don't want the surface of that desk marred. What will it be? You see... I have let go of the metal, is that right? Good Lord. Mm. Many seconds ago, it should have crashed to the desk, am I right? Well, this is incredible. Well, if you want to speak to me anymore, I'll be right outside. But it hasn't fallen. That's right, sir. It hasn't fallen. It floats in the air. That's right, sir. It floats in the air. Uh, how do you do it? Why don't you call your engineers and ask them? I'll wait outside. Miss Holmes, get me my engineers. Immediately. All right, Mr. Wilkins, you're quite right. The piece of metal is apparently counter-gravity. And my engineers can give me no explanation. Thank you, sir. Now, what do you want? For well, my services? Yes. You've already set the price. To build a pilot model based on this sample, no great expenditure, a hundred of the cost of your behemoth sitting out there in your building yard. Three other things. A workshop, 
expert mechanical assistance, and an answer to one question. What is your question? Why do you want so much to build this ship? Frankly, because I love power. Because I'm ambitious. I want to be the first to conquer space, because if I can do it, it'll make me greater, richer, stronger than any man has ever been. I want to be the master, not only of one world, but of worlds. Mm, that's an honest answer. But is it the only one? You see those letters in gold on the prow of my ship? Crowder's Folly, that's what they named it. That's what they think of me. I want to cram those words down their petty little throats and let them eat mud. That's another answer. And that's all? That is as far as your thinking goes? What other answer is there to your question? There's my own answer. I want to leave this planet and go elsewhere, to Mars, perhaps, because there are strange wonders yet to be found. Because there will be scarlet sunsets over barren wastes. And in the star-strewn night, the thin, cold air of a dying world stirring in restless sighs across the valleys of the dry canals. <laughs> oh, well, you may laugh out loud if you wish, Mr. Crowder. I would prefer that to the peculiar repressed smile you're now exhibiting. <laughs> You're a very lucky man, Mr. Wilkins, in that you have scientific talent. Because your talents as a poet are inferior and very sentimental. All right. You're a sentimentalist, and I'm a man of action. No matter. We can work together, you and I. Your workshop will be ready by morning. I don't need to hear from you again till you have something to show me. If you need to see me, call me day or night. I'll be available. But don't bother me with details, because I probably won't understand what you're talking about anyhow. If you need money or materials or personnel, just tell my engineers. You'll get it, or I'll know the reason why. Now, that's all. Thank you, sir. Miss Holmes, get me my engineers. One show that I particularly like to recall is one that was called You Are There. And I was on every show for the entire run of the series, two and a half years, I was the only actor who was permanently on it, as opposed to the announcers or the mm -hmm. newsmen. You remember the eruption of Mount Vesuvius oh, then? Of course, yes. <laughs> You've got an education as well as a, a career. My steady <laughs> job was the signature voice, You are there! You remember that? <laughs> then sometimes I would do nothing but that, sometimes I'd do small part, sometimes I'd do medium part, and sometimes I'd do a lead. I played Napoleon on two separate occasions, one I think the uh, embarkation for Elba, and the other one I don't remember what it was. And then I was William the Conqueror in the Battle of Hastings. Mm -hmm. And th those, those were very interesting shows. That was a do. program uniquely suited for radio. It, oh, had yes. a, it had a great run on television, but it really wasn't a no. television show. No, it never it did work properly. No. I recall, for example, listening to... Uh, well, for example, the uh, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the destruction yeah. of Pompeii, and mm -hmm. an announcer describing it, and then suddenly yelling, "Look out for that cable!" You know that sort of thing. <laughs> and it was marvelous because you could accept this, yes. but you couldn't accept it if obviously you were looking at it and seeing a video trap no. there or something of no, that nature. No, it, it didn't really work. But the interesting thing is that there you had a show that was admirably suited to radio, and it was on the air. CBS kept it on the air for two and a half years, and it never sold commercially. As soon as it went to television for which it was not suited, it sold right away. Mm. Yes, Mr. Crowder? We have 50 men working on preserving that useless hulk out there in the construction yards. Lay them off. Well, the How ship many will others? deteriorate if we do that, sir. Let it rot. Lay them off. Yes, sir. How many other employees are still working for us on the project? About uh, 3,000, sir, including the people working on experimental motors. Get rid of them. Sir? Get rid of them. Mr. Crowder, I... I never thought you'd drop this project. You were so adamant I'm not dropping anything but Deadwood. You saw what Wilkins had to offer. He's my man. And the rest is junk and nonsense. Mr. Crowder, he might fail. We ought to have a minimum of protection I against... I say he won't fail. I know the goods when I see it. The rest is nonsense. Several of the experimenters were making much greater progress than I thought was possible. There are great opportunities there. I'm not interested. And not only in the field of spaceships, sir. One man has a motor no bigger than a football, 
which will drive an automobile 24 hours on four cents worth of fuel. It's almost finished, sir. Not interested. It will be of great benefit to mankind, sir. Your name will go down... My in... name will go down in history for this spaceship. The profits in such a motor, sir. I have more money now than I even know how to count. And when I make my space flight, I'll have more than that. Yes, sir. You just lay everybody off that isn't needed. Give them two weeks' pay and my thanks for a thankless job well done. And that's all. Yes, sir, I'll get it done, sir. Oh, one more thing. There's no need to let the folly rot. Dismantle it. Sell the basic materials we don't need. Salvage whatever will be useful to us. That's all. A year's work. Yes. And ten years or twenty years, and I do the same thing. That's why you're an engineer, and I'm an executive. That's why you work for me. Because when I have to, I can be ruthless with my own mistakes. When a thing has lost its usefulness to me, I get rid of it. Well? I was just thinking, Mr. Crowder. What would happen to me if my usefulness to you were over? I've worked for you 20 years now. Uh, just don't give me any occasion to consider your usefulness terminated. That oughtn't to be too hard. Hmm. What? Uh, nothing, sir. I'll make the arrangements at once. Who are you? What do you want? I tried to stop him, sir. Well, speak up, man. My name is Jar Vizustuli. I'm an electronics expert. Oh, yes, I remember. You're the Indian. Come in, come in. But do you want me, sir? I can never... Never mind, Miss Holmes. Just stay outside. Close the door behind you. Sit down, Vizustuli. Thank you, no. I want to give you a gift before I leave. Oh? Are you leaving? I thought we still needed you. I resigned. Sorry to hear that. I'm told you're a good man. I want you to understand what's behind this gift. Huh? I was working on a power project in my country which would have meant a tremendous rise in the standard of living for millions of my people. I was unable to resist the money you offered. Well, had you resisted, even more money would have been forthcoming. I placed no limit on your worth to me. I understand. But you see, I did not come without a sense of guilt. Because there was no one in my country who could take my place. I would assume that. And now I discover that what I did was for nothing. The spaceship on which I worked is being dismantled. That's right. So I have been corrupted by you... At a whim. I think you have too much power, sir. I think you use your power for evil, selfish purpose. Selfish, yes. Evil, no. Only sentimentality is evil. I think otherwise. And so, in order that you shall not corrupt anyone else, I have this gift for you. Here you are, sir. <laughs> and just one more shot for good measure to make sure you're really dead. Good. Uh, Miss Holmes, there's a man on his way out by the name of Job. He's used to be an engineer. He's not to be molested. He probably won't stop at the cashier, so I want a check for six months' salary in advance mailed to his home address. The man uh, showed a certain quality of ruthlessness, which is deserving of recognition. Oh, and uh, have the chief of the company police bring me a new bulletproof vest. This one seems to have been dented in a couple of places. <laughs> The new spaceship, according to Wilkins' plans, as executed by Crowder's engineers, was finished within four months. It was small, it was shaped like a disc. It gleamed brightly even in the smoky haze of an October sunset. Inside, Crowder and Mr. Wilkins, in a small cubicle at the heart of the machine, sat surrounded by many instruments of a complicated nature. Outside, huge crowds gathered to witness the test. They stirred and murmured, waiting restlessly, as inside the control room of the craft, Wilkins installed the final secret part he had not revealed to those who built his driving apparatus. Well, 
Well, Wilkins, what's holding us up? Nothing new. Oh, sentiment, perhaps? A wish to look once more on Earth's familiar scenes? There. Now the screening is removed. Look. Look at the people out there. Never mind looking out there. Let's leave that thing closed. You're a sentimental fool. Or are you afraid? Or did you decide at the last minute that your invention would work? It will work. Uh, sit down, Mr. Crowder. Uh, thank you. Uh, do me a favor. When I press this button, will you please press the button on the arm of the chair in which you're seated? I'll tell you when. Turn on your motor. I want to hear its roar and feel its tug as we cut loose from Earth's gravity and fly outward into space. <laughs> that might be a moment in which I'd share your sentimentality. Press your button now, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Well, because I'm beginning to distrust you. If this is all a hoax, when are we going to take off? You said at five sharp, and it's two minutes after five now. Well, do we move or don't we? Mr. Crowder, we're already moving. The button you pushed was to nullify the effects of acceleration. If you don't mind, sir, I'd like to open the screen again. Now, if you care to look, see for yourself. Wilkins! We're in space. Look down at the Earth. How far we've come. Why, it's no bigger than a toy balloon. No, a dime. No, a firefly. Man, man, Wilkins, you've done it. Yes. I swore to be the first man to conquer space. And I've done it. It's a triumph of power and ambition. And sentiment. Last sentiment. Your maudlin dreaming would have died unborn except for me. I made this possible, Wilkins. Don't you ever forget that? My capital, my forcefulness, my will. Look out there. Space. Stars that never were seen from Earth. This is only the beginning. We'll build a larger model. One great enough to hold a hundred men, a thousand, and cargo besides. Whoever wants to leave Earth this moment must come to me. I am the master of the planet. <sighs> All right, Wilkins. Turn back now. No. Huh? I said turn back. No. Well, we, we, we proved the ship can fly now. Now turn back. I want to start work at once in preparation for the long flights to come. Not so. We will go on. What are you doing? Defying me? I'll break your puny little body into pieces. Can you control this ship, Mr. Crowder? Would you like to be stranded out here in space, just adrift in space without control? Would you like that? Turn back. No. What's the matter with you? Are you out of your mind? Oh, I am a sentimentalist, Mr. Crowder. Your money and ambition paved the way, that's true. But sentiment was the vital factor that sent me to you. Sentiment, sir. You see, Mr. Crowder, I wanted to go home. Home? Home? You are out of your mind. You will forgive me if I remove these primitive clothes? Who? Who? Who are you? Oh, it's all right, Mr. Crowder. I hold no special malice toward you. There's no need to be so terrified because you've had your first close look at a Martian. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Vital Factor by Nelson Bond, as adapted for radio by Howard Rodman. Featured in the cast were Joe DeSantis, Guy Sorrell, John McGovern, Rant Richards, Louis Van Ruten, Richard Hamilton, and Florence Williams. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production.